So I once again invite Dr. Kumar Rajamani to speak on intracranial hemorrhage. All right. Um, welcome back again. Um, oh, Richard, by the way, we do have a wall, two walls. And if the, this is an inside joke. Rahul Dravid was a, a you know, was called the wall, a uh, very strong, very good cricket player called the wall, never got out. But we are not parting with him at all, so you can forget about it. <laughs> so let's, uh, the next uh, talk is uh, on hemorrhagic stroke. About uh, five, or maybe 10 to 15 percent of all strokes are hemorrhagic strokes. It can be variable depending upon the population you study. Uh, in our population, maybe uh, in, in, in India, in Pune, maybe slightly more than in the West because of uncontrolled blood pressure and um, other such situations. Uh, but majority of the um, studies mention about 10% of strokes. Hemorrhagic strokes are devastating conditions and much like head injury, the, the guidelines are a little vague and a little uh, less certainty exists uh, in the management and treatment of these extremely sick patients. The mortality rate is extremely high, the morbidity is high, but unfortunately the, the treatments that we have are not very good. Um, again, I'm basing my, my talk on the guidelines. This is the 2015 guidelines. Uh, there hasn't been, sorry, there hasn't been any updates since, but I think it's due. Um, when I'm talking about intracranial hem intra cerebral hemorrhage, we're talking about intraparenchymal hemorrhage and intraventricular hemorrhage as hemorrhagic strokes. The others, which include subarachnoid hemorrhage, I think we're going to have a, a, a talk later on, and the epidural and subdural hemorrhages are a different beast altogether. So as I said, non-traumatic intracerebral hemorrhages uh, are about 10 to 15 percent of all strokes. As you know, the age of the population is rising, the incidence is rising, uh, and it has a very high mortality and morbidity. The risk factors traditionally that are associated with intracerebral hemorrhage is high blood pressure, age and high blood pressure. Uh, in the West, in the US, there are certain ethnic groups that are prone. Uh, I'm not sure that any such data exists uh, for us here. So by and large, hypertension is the single most common and important cause of uh, intracerebral hemorrhage. There are other less common causes, but very important to note them in individual patients. Uh, they may be hematologic causes, bleeding disorders, uh, vascular conditions such as arterial venous malformations, uh, aneurysms that rupture, uh, less common conditions such as Moya Moya disease that can sometimes present with uh, brain hemorrhages, uh, amyloid angiopathy, which we are seeing more and more of uh, in the elderly population. The hemorrhagic transformation of an ischemic infarct is a totally different uh, clinical condition altogether. The treatment is quite different. Hemorrhagic infarct or a venous infarct uh, after cerebral venous thrombosis has hemorrhagic components. Uh, tumors sometimes can have hemorrhage, um, metastases, meningiomas, and others. Uh, then there are other causes due to drugs, illicit drug use, such you know, vaso vasoactive agents, uh, other over-the-counter medications sometimes which may go unrecognized. And of course, uh, the poisoning that we physicians do to our patients with medications, with warfarin and aspirin and other such medications. But the commonest up to almost 70 to 80 percent would be hypertension is the single most important cause. Spontaneous deep intracerebral hemorrhage, the single most important cause is uh, hypertension. When a patient presents with an acute stroke, there is no way that you can clinically distinguish between ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke. There is no uh, study that has shown convincingly that you can distinguish that on a clinical basis. You need to have a, uh, imaging, uh, 
a CAT scan or an MRI scan to distinguish between a hemorrhagic stroke and an ischemic stroke. So when you do a CAT scan, there are several things that you can look for in somebody with a brain hemorrhage. First of all, the location of the hemorrhage, the size of the hemorrhage. Here, it's, you know, it's located in the uh, thalamus. You see a slight hypointensity around it. Uh, that's a perihematoma ischemic region. Uh, they can be sometimes intraventricular extension, which is not seen here, mass effect. There may be other underlying, sometimes underlying etiologies that may be obvious, a vascular malformation may be obvious, a brain tumor may be obvious, uh, but often you won't see any of those. A fracture, if it is a, uh, if it is a traumatic brain injury. So those are the various things that you can pick up on a CAT scan. A hypertensive intracranial hemorrhage, the usual, the typical sites of hemorrhage are uh, the putamen, the basal ganglia, uh, the thalamus, can have it in the uh, pons and in the cerebellum. Sorry for this uh, mix-up. That's the pons and that's the cerebellum. Uh, the lobar hemorrhages are less common. So the majority of hypertensive bleeds happen in the deep basal ganglia. And why is that? It's probably because of the rupture of these small penetrating end vessels that arise from these large vessels at the base of the brain. That's the middle cerebral artery and the perforating vessels which go into the base of the brain and supply the basal ganglia. These are the vessels that get affected by chronic uncontrolled hypertension. And in fact, that's, those are the vessels that were described many years ago uh, in the mid 19th century by Charcot and Bouchard. And those dilations were called as Charcot Bouchard aneurysms. Why these vessels are affected? It, there may be some physics involved. You know, these small vessels that come off the blood pressure effect is uh, uh, disproportionately, disproportionately affecting these tiny vessels probably is one possible uh, suggestion. Uh, more recently, in the 1950s, that is, C. Miller Fisher uh, showed that there were changes of uh, fibrinoid necrosis and lipohyalinosis in these vessels. And in fact, it's this, these are the same vessels that when occluded result in lacunar strokes. So the lacunar syndromes that commonly see that we commonly see from high blood pressure uh, affect the same areas of the brain. So moving on to the um, management, the medical management controls consists of blood pressure management, uh, recognition and prevention of hematoma expansion. The perilegional edema, uh, if we can do anything about it, does it matter? Seizures, prophylaxis. Hematoma expansion is a early problem and a, and a major cause of uh, worsening of patients. So this is an example of a, uh, a patient uh, that presents with weakness and then very rapidly, within a few hours, gets six hours in this case, uh, you see the patient is worsened and there is a big si increase in the size of the hematoma. There are lots of theories as to why this could be the case. It could be uh, uncontrolled hypertension uh, and you know, progressive uh, increase in bleeding. Hematoma ex expansion occurs within the first few hours in up to 38% of uh, patients in this study. And if there is hematoma expansion, there seems to be an increased mortality and morbidity associated uh, increasing several fold because of uh, hematoma expansion. So then is there a role to try and find out if there is hematoma expansion and try to prevent it? And one of the things that was done was uh, what is called as the CTA spot sign. You, you do a CT angiogram and you see that leakage of contrast within the hematoma. And this is a good 
predictor of uh, hematoma expansion. In addition to, to that, high blood pressure tends to predict hematoma expansion, hyperglycemia, and of course, if the patient's on antiplatelet agents or has a coagulopathy, then those are the individuals that tend to have uh, increase in the size of the hematoma. This is how you measure the size of the hematoma. You know, you, it's A is this, uh, in this axis, the B is the uh, straight axis, and then C is the, the thickness of the clot based on the number of slices on the CAT scan. And it's presumed to be an ellipsoid, and the volume is uh, A times B times C by two. And in this uh, patient, it's a sort of a moderate-sized hematoma. Controlling blood pressure, does it improve hematoma expansion? It's been shown that there, there can be some reduction, but whether that uh, or, uh, is reflected in improved clinical outcomes, that's a different question. Correction of coagulopathy, if there is any, is important. Uh, patient, uh, platelet transfusions have been tried, and I'll come to that in a second. Uh, it makes good sense to keep the glucose under tight glycemic control. For blood pressure control, you want to avoid certain medication, uh, group of medications, especially the vasodilators. That can, uh, vasodilators can increase the cerebral blood volume, can worsen cerebral edema, and reduce the cerebral perfusion pressure, and it's, uh, you should be avoided. The other uh, fear that you have when you lower the blood pressure is the circulation around the hematoma. The perihematoma, uh, low intensity area that you see, there may be an area of ischemia or penumbra, presumably, and it may, there may be an altered uh, autoregulation of the cerebral blood flow in that area, and lowering blood pressure may induce worsening of that ischemia. The one thing that you don't want to do is make things worse for the patient than he already is. But st uh, a PET scan study that has looked at cerebral blood flow uh, in these patients has not shown any alteration of, uh, uh, of the perilegional uh, blood flow uh, on reduction of uh, arterial blood pressure. And they subsequently uh, several studies, including the Interact 2 study and the ATACH 2, have now shown that blood pressure can be reduced quite safely without any worsening of the symptoms. But what didn't pan out was the improvement in the outcome in uh, uh, aggressive reduction of blood pressure. What was recommended is continuous blood pressure monitoring, you know, use uh, infusion of nicaridipine. Um, I don't know if it's available in this country, but nicaridipine is what we use preferentially uh, in our hospital setting. Antibi uh, sorry, uh, complications should be anticipated. There can be ongoing bleeding or re-bleeding, development of mass effect, and if there is intraventricular hemorrhage, you can have uh, development of hydrocephalus due to CSF flow blockage. There was a time when recombinant factor 7A was, was uh, tried. Phase two trial showed that the increase in the size of the hematoma was reduced if you use it early on, but that did not translate into clinical outcomes. It also increased the risk of thrombotic complications, and hence currently uh, the recommendation is not to use recombinant factor 7A. The other trial that was done was platelet transfusions in somebody who has been on antiplatelet medications, and that resulted in uh, intracerebral hemorrhage, the PATCH trial. Currently, the, uh, the recommendation is for no platelet transfusions to be used because it did not, again, alter the clinical outcome. The only exception to this rule may be if any surgical intervention is anticipated, uh, 
and you know, so the surgeon wants a clean field as much as possible, and oozing and uh, bleeding is not something that surgeons like. Seizures, the routine use of anti-epileptic medications is not recommended. But a significant number of patients will develop clinical seizures. If they have clinical seizures, you want to uh, treat them aggressively. You want to have a very low threshold or very uh, high index of suspicion. Uh, if there is an alteration in sensorium in patients with intracerebral hemorrhage, they could be having subclinical or electrographic seizures. I don't like to call them subclinical. Electrographic seizures. Uh, you want to monitor them with EEG in the ICU setting. And you may find electrographic seizures or sometimes even status epilepticus. In that case, the treatment should be uh, quite aggressive. Prognostic factors, the, there is a very high morbidity and mortality, one. High intracerebral volume, sorry, high volume of intracerebral hemorrhage is a risk factor for poor outcome. Advanced age, a low Glasgow coma score, uh, infratentorial location of the hemorrhage, and presence of uh, intraventricular hemorrhage are all adverse outcome events. And these have been sort of uh, codified into what's called as an ICH score. And more higher the score, higher the mortality. As you can see, four and five are pretty, even maybe three, pretty dismal mortality. Quickly go through the neurosurgical options for intracerebral hemorrhage. You can do uh, cr craniectomy and clot aspiration. Um, if there is intraventricular hemorrhage, they may need a ventriculostomy. Development of increased intracranial pressure, uh, you need monitoring and drainage of fluid. And for cerebellar hemorrhages, the, the, the treatment is, is quite standard if most neurosurgeons would offer uh, removal of the clot if it, is cerebral, if it is three centimeters or more in the posterior fossa. This is an example of a, a, a clot supratentorial where there's a hemicrinectomy with, with the clot aspiration. Unfortunately, there was no change in the exam after the surgery. And the International Surgical Trial for Intracerebral Hemorrhage, the STITCH trials, STITCH 2, uh, revealed that there was a possible trend towards benefit of surgery in patients with superficial cortical hemorrhage, but there was no benefit in those with deep ganglionic hemorrhages. So the American Stroke Association guideline is for most patients with supratentorial intracerebral hemorrhage, the usefulness of surgery is not well established. It's a 2B recommendation. What they also go on to say is for supratentorial hematoma evacuation, in patients who are worsening, it might be considered as a sort of a life-saving, desperate measure. What can also be, and what's also being done uh, is this minimally invasive surgery where they put in a, um, a, a burr hole and put a catheter in the, in the ventricle, sorry, in the body of the hematoma and also instill TPA to dissolve the clot and, and they are able to remove this over the next few days. As you can see in this example, that big clot there and installation of TPA and it sort of, sort of tries to dissolve it and aspirate it out over the next few days. These, this is being studied in the trial called the MISTI trial. Uh, the, I believe the randomization is complete. Uh, the, final results are still awaited. The current recommendations hence says the effectiveness of minimally invasive clot evacuation with stereotactic or endoscopic aspiration with or without thrombolytic usage is uncertain. So currently we don't have any evidence to use that, but the results of the MISTI trial are eagerly awaited. The next is uh, intraventricular hemorrhage where uh, drainage of, of the fluid 
is, uh, is, is recommended. And even though the outcomes may not be um, very dramatically different, uh, it does help in the management of the patient for managing the ICP and drainage of fluids. I think this is what those uh, catheters look like. I'm not a neurosurgeon myself, but uh, you know, help the, the team formulating protocols and follow these patients afterwards in my clinic uh, as and when they uh, recover. But as a armchair neurologist, I would like to say prevention is the best treatment for these severely sick hypertension patient, uh, hypertensive hemorrhages patients. I think that's my last slide. Thank you. The most common site for hypertensive intracerebral hemorrhages What is F? <laughs> Good. I think most 92% got, got it right. That's great. And the next one, 67-year-old comes to the emergency department with acute onset of right-sided weakness with brain imaging showing an acute hemorrhage in the left basal ganglia. He has history of coronary artery disease for which he was on aspirin. He is admitted to the intensive care unit for blood pressure control. No acute neurosurgical interventions are being planned currently. What is the best, what, which of the following describes the role of platelet transfusions in this case? I think um, you guys got it absolutely right. There's it, there is a role for platelet transfusions only if the neurosurgeon is planning some procedures. Otherwise, it doesn't help in altering the outcome uh, of, the, of the patients in the form of disability or mortality. Thank you. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Kostov Indogar, sir, to kindly felicitate Dr. Kumar Rajmani.